a remarkable man. His story, you know, his life story is incredible. The man is just a walking legend. He is a fantastic person. He, I like him, I love him very, very much. Of course, he was a great man, but he helped us also to be successful by his presence. A life touched by tragedy. I always felt that uh, Bobby went into Munich as a boy, but came out as a man. I pulled him about 15, 20 yards away. I thought they were dead. I'm sure at the time, they would have been thinking, will I ever play again? But he not only played again, I mean, he won everything that you could possibly win. A purist, a lover of the simple things. Bob would have played football with the him or not. Whenever you see him play, he always that, had that sweep, didn't he, of the, of the hair. We had a bit of a laugh about that, you know, but uh, <laughs> he, he wasn't going to change it because of us. He turned despair into the extraordinary. Different class, absolutely different class. Every generation comes by, you get, you get a naturally gifted play. Alf used to say, give the ball to Bobby. It's up from Charlton, it's worth trying. He continues to be the figure they all aspire to emulate. You just got to sit and watch the goals. I mean, they're just, they're unbelievable goals. And here comes Charlton! Oh, great goal! To do what he's done, you're talking about, you know, one in a million footballer. Without doubt, he's, he's up there with the best. Unquestionably the best player of all time. Sir Robert Charlton, Knight of the Realm, Ambassador of Football. Bobby Charlton of Manchester United in England. Our Bob. Nearly 40 years have passed since he finished playing here, and he no longer glides around Old Trafford like he once did. There are many too young ever to have seen him play, but those that did, those that remember him, find it impossible to forget just how good he was. Incomparably good. In his 70s, he is still adored. But once, he was a colossus out here. He is a player with great grace, moved across the ground very easily. Beautiful balance, two-footed, had a beautiful running style. Could um, float across the ground just like a piece of silver paper. When Bob got the ball, the crowd would just an intake of breath. <gasps> now it's Charlton, Bobby Charlton. I used to love that. I mean, that was fantastic, because that's my brother doing there, you know. Maybe a shot from Charlton. It's worth trying. Some of the things that he used to do back in the day were, in, were incredible. Believe me, this man could punch a ball really, really and accurately. You know, he didn't score the sort of easy tappings that I used to get. He used to get proper goals and blast them in from 30 yards and 25 yards. Charlie trying to get the shot and he's on his right foot. Oh, you beauty! You beauty! For me, enjoy, you can see that he enjoys it. You know, the left-footed players, they are a breed on their own and there's something about them that just breeds like brilliance. Oh, yeah, it'd be... He'd be one of the top players in the midfield if, if, if he was playing now. I think there was always this method that players of that era couldn't play in the modern day football, which is a lot of nonsense. Bobby Charlton in his day would have played in any era. He was a fantastic player. You probably don't see anyone scoring goals like that, um, even today. And here comes Charlton! Oh, great! Oh, it's what you dream of, isn't it? I, I, dreamt, I dreamt of being a footballer. My whole family was football mad. And all my uncles were football, footballers. And uh, the best thing I ever did when I, when I signed to play for this, to this club, it's just magic, absolute magic. He was born in the large coal mining village of Ashington, Northumberland in October 1937. He was a cousin of Jackie Milburn, a legend at Newcastle United. 
He had four uncles who were all professional footballers. She comes from a famous soccer family, the Milburns. Her cousin Jackie played for Newcastle and England, and her father, grandfather and three brothers were all professionals in their day. His mother, Sissy, was just as mad about the game. It was this love of football that was deeply embedded in the family DNA that offered an alternative to traditional working life in Ashington. My mother was always one who was different. In the days in the 50s, 60s, very few women knew very much about football. It wasn't a woman's sphere. But my mother grew up among four brothers who did nothing else. And she was kicking a ball around with them and she was quite a tomboy, my mother. Well, coming from a football family, what can you expect? I mean, uh, four brothers that all played professional and they were just brought up in a football atmosphere and the mother was a football fanatic. She loved her football. She, she used to be a, a coach in one of the schools. She used to go and teach the kids how to play football. I had a, a sideboard with the Queen Anne legs and that was their goalposts. Used to dive on the bottom in front of this Queen Anne, you know, the, and uh, Bobby especially used to love to dive across the kitchen. The first time I remember actually having a, having a shot at goal was my, my uncle Tommy who bought my first pair of uh, Playfair football boots. Lads used to come to our house and say, are your two kids, two lads playing football on a Sunday morning? But they didn't have a ball because it was during the war and nobody had balls except us because we're uncles when they came home and visited the family used to bring us the football. Sundays, everyone congregated at the local park and uh, there was a game that used to go on. It started at about 8 o'clock in the morning and finished at 8 o'clock at night. And people just used to leave for their lunch or for to go to the pub. And it, was, it just went on forever and ever. And I, I, I was playing sometimes about six or seven hours. On a, and I, but I, I loved every minute of it, really. We used to play headers across the ghouls. There was two toilets on the other side, but then there's a hole in each wall. And that, that was... The, and I used to win all the time because I used to knock, lob the balls over his head and they would hit the wall at the back and if you scored in the goal. And uh, anything on the ground, he'd murder me. Anything up in the air, I'd murder him. Bob used to play then and he was outstanding. He, he, he could run rings around bigger lads. Didn't matter how they tried to get him, you know, and there was some tough guys. Nobody got anywhere near him. The adults started asking me if I would play for them. When I, when I was about eight or nine, I think it was. And the, the big lads, you know, come on, play. And so I, and I used to find it reasonably comfortable, and I think that's when, I, when finally I decided, you know, this is what I, I wanted to be, a footballer. I mean, from the day Bobby Charlton played football, when he was whatever height, everybody knew that he would be a footballer, if he was gonna be a great player. I remember him playing for England youth and I remember him coming back with a photograph of his cap and all that. And that, that, was, that was quite good. And he let me wear his cap. And I, I, I wish I'd had a photo taken. <laughs> Everybody knew him in the North East. Nobody knew me, but they all knew him. But that was okay. And of course, then the fame started and the they came and tried to sign him up and that, and the first one was Manchester. To Matt Busby at his desk at Old Trafford came boys from all parts of the country, boys eager to play football under the greatest manager in the game. And thus began the legend of the Busby Babes. The one question that everybody always asked Matt Busby was this. The first question, Matt, is how do you find these boys? Well, I'd say, Bill, I have a scouting system whose sole object is to go out looking for young, promising school boys youth club boys and indeed any young players who have the necessary natural ability to have a, make a future Man United player. Somebody said to me, there's a scout from Manchester United watching you today, Bobby. You know, I, I played the match and, and afterwards little, little Joe Armstrong, he was a lovely man, he, uh, he, he just shuffled across the pitch to me, you know. He says, now, Bobby, if you want to play football for Manchester United when you leave school in the summer, we'd be very pleased to take you. And I said, I, I said, yes, OK. If they were the first, that, that was going to be the decision I was going to make, and, and it was Manchester United. Bob had made his mind up he was going to Manchester. 
they were the first ones to show any interest. And he wanted to go, and he went. It was leaving Ashington for Manchester, one of the industrial powerhouses of the land, a footballing powerhouse. He was just 15 years old. When I first got off the train at Manchester, Jimmy Murphy picked me up at the station uh, to take me to my digs and sort of make you feel comfortable and welcome. And then I said, um, oh, we're going to Old Trafford now. And, and he says, yeah, we're going to Old Trafford. I says, where is it? And, and I'm looking around at all the black buildings. And he says, uh, oh, Old Trafford is in Trafford Park. And I went, oh, Trafford Park, very nice lot, nice trees and open spaces, I think. The Trafford Park was, was the largest industrial estate in Europe at that time. Jimmy Murphy was assistant manager and youth team coach at United, mentor and guide for a fledgling professional. A lot of young players tend to think that they're going to do it all themselves, and football's a team game, and you have to learn to play as a team. And Jimmy, Jimmy spent years and years, <laughs> it seemed an eternity, uh, teaching me all the things that he should know as a professional player. As I grew a little bit older, all the, all the lessons that he was trying to teach me were all, all coming into my head. He thought Bobby Charlton was one of the best players that the world has ever seen, never mind Manchester United. He regarded the players as his orchard, and uh, his job was to produce the best apples possible. And occasionally, someone like Bobby, he'd refer to them as his golden apples. I've seen a golden apple, and uh, he couldn't wait for them to mature and be picked. Now football is a pleasant game, played in the sun, played in the rain, and the team that gets me excited, Manchester United, Manchester. I knew about uh, the Busby Babes. I mean, I'd read about it in the papers. At that particular time, it was unheard of, you know, that, that young players were replacing people in the, in the middle 30s. But Matt Busby said, if you're good enough, you know, you know, you'll be able to do it. I felt it was a bit of a challenge, that. I felt, you know, Man Man Manchester United have, have now they've got the best reputation for, for breeding young players. I said, I, I'm in the right place. Another golden apple among the Busby babes was Duncan Edwards. It became a best pal because we were both stationed doing a national service. So I spent a lot of time with him. And, and I mean, you could almost come off and leave him against 11 men. He would, he would beat them on his own. I really, I really did used to think that I was a good player. And I, and I wasn't afraid of, of having, a, having a go at, at it being the best if I could be, you know. But I, I never felt I, was the, I could ever be the best when I played with him because he was just fantastic. There were the other good players that were there, Billy Whelan from Dublin, um, Eddie Coleman, David Pegg, you know, they were all in the youth team and, and they were all recognised first division players. It was, it was just paradise. I kept thinking, well, I'm, I'm scoring goals in the reserves. Why, why doesn't he pick me? Why doesn't he pick me for the first team? I played a match in the reserves at City, and uh, and the centre half and I hit the ball at the same time, and and me uh, me right me right foot it, it just it, it just and two weeks later, Matt Busby somebody said Matt Busby wants you in his office on Friday. Right, so I went I went up and. Uh, and he says, how's your, how's your ankle? I says, oh, my ankle's fine. Says, my ankle's fine, you know. And he says, he says, OK, well, congratulations. You're playing in the first team tomorrow. And he shook hands, like, very formal, you know. Yeah, first time. So uh, I played, yeah, scored two. In Charlton's first season, United took the league title and so became the first English team to take part in the European Cup. The Football League wanted us to, to not to go into this tournament. You know, he said, we've got enough, we've got enough fixtures. And uh, Matt Busby had worked it out. He says, no, this is, this is the future. This is, where we're, this is where we're going into Europe. 